one took Captain Chuck Yeager to the other side. After years of endeavor, the supersonic age arrived, not with a whimper, but with a sonic bang. The rocket craft cracked a sonic barrier. Human flight, faster than sound. At first, Jaeger never even realized he'd done it. He thought his dial was faulty. Technology and human endeavor had done it. The first jet fighter to benefit from the all-moving tail was the F-86 Sabre. With its all-moving tail, the Sabre could reach the speed of sound in a dive and the pilot remain in control. To this day, this aircraft is still regarded as one of the most beautiful aircraft ever built, even compared to other jets. The lines on it are so smooth, so clean, so flowing. You look at it and it looks like fast. It was fast. The new jet fighters were capable of speeds their young pilots had never encountered, certainly not in combat. And that combat soon came in the Cold War in Korea in 1950. In the skies over Korea, Jet engaged with Jet in combat for the first time. American Sabre would be pitted against Russian MiG, axial flow Jet against centrifugal. As a wartime ally, the Soviet Union had received centrifugal jet engine technology from Britain and created the MiG-15. The Sabre, on the other hand, was making use of the latest axial flow power plant, which gave the aircraft its more streamlined form. These are the ailerons. The tail surfaces are hydraulic. The only thing that is not is the rudder, and that is still operated. The aircraft carries six M3 50 caliber machine guns, Firing all six guns at the same time, you could feel the reduction of the aircraft slowing down because of that recoil in there that the whole aircraft was absorbing. The Browning 50 caliber machine gun was fitted as standard on most American warplanes throughout World War II. The MiG was armed differently. They carried two 23-millimeter rapid-fire cannons and one 37-millimeter uh, slow-fire cannon. When the 23-millimeter projectiles were going by my canopy, they looked like golf balls. And when the 37-millimeter projectile was going by my canopy, it looked like a tennis ball. And you could hear them because they're supersonic, like that. The bullets were supersonic but the guns belonged to an earlier, slower age, as did their sights. Target opportunities in jet combat were gone in a flash. In World War II, when they would look out, they would see fighters at a distance, but the jet fighter pilots had to learn to look at fighters a lot further out, so they had to see even better than before. Firing bullets from a moving plane at a moving target was always difficult. At speeds in excess of 500 uh, in, uh, miles per uh, hour, it was becoming in impossible. Rotating aircraft. If the aircraft are turning around in any sort of way, then they might aim a gun in one direction, but in fact, it completely misses the target. So in order to compensate for the spinning motion, for the rotating motion, if I really do want to, to hit Ben with this ball, I have to throw the ball a bit to the left of Ben, like that, and there it goes, straight at him. With the jet fighter, the problem, known as deflection, got a lot worse. You have both a moving target and yourself are sitting in a moving platform. And then when you start thinking that through, you have the bullets that you're firing, which themselves are affected by gravity, affected by wind. The jets didn't just have World War II guns. The MiG-15 had World War II gun sights as well, like this one from a Spitfire. Now this is called a combining glass because it's combining the view of the outside world with this little graticule that's projected 
up through here. Now what we have on here are some means for presetting the range to the target aircraft. You also have another control that gives you an estimate of the distance away to the targets. And that really was the best you could do. The limitation is that you have no measure of the movement of the target. And here was to be the significant advantage. The Sabre had radar ranging, capable of reading the distance to the target at any speed. This is called a radome. It's a composite material. It's not metal skin like the fuselage. And behind this is the radar antenna. And it sent out a signal that would reflect off of a target, come back, be picked up by this antenna here, and then translated to an image up in the cockpit that would tell us whether an object was at 4,000 feet or 2,000 feet or 1,000 feet distance out. It made the difference. Although the aircraft's performances were closely matched on paper, the domination of the skies by the Sabre became an overwhelming 10 to 1. The Sabre outgunned the MiG by superior targeting technology. In 1949, the Soviet Union detonated its first atomic device, and the arms race went nuclear. The world now had a nightmare scenario. Moscow and Washington within striking distance of each other, hordes of bombers armed with nuclear payloads. It was a real fear. Governments on all sides prepared for nuclear attack. Survival would depend on one thing, reaction time. A warplane was needed that was so fast it could destroy attackers before they could reach their targets. And both sides were investing in it. It was the supersonic interceptor. We needed an airplane that was extremely fast that could get to supersonic speeds very quickly because all it takes is one bomber getting through because now they're carrying thermonuclear weapons. And one airplane literally could destroy an entire city. The stakes are very, very high. The race was on for a supersonic intercept fighter, one that could reach Mach 1 and beyond in level flight. America's early response was the Convair F-102. The F-102 incorporated all the lessons learned in the assault on the sound barrier. It was designed to be the next generation of truly supersonic warplane. It ticked all the boxes, but it couldn't get there. They have the big engine, they're using the swept wing, they're using the delta wing, which is nice and thin, it should be real fast, and it should go supersonic, but when they built one, guess what? It doesn't quite go supersonic. Something was wrong. The sum of everything aviation scientists knew was there in the F-102. They had the jet engine, they had the latest wing, but they couldn't get through the wall. The demons were back. They turned to aerodynamicist Dr. Richard Whitcomb at NASA for help. Almost all air supersonic airplanes were not going supersonic because of this problem. What was the problem? The thing that they failed to understand at that time was the, the aerodynamics. They ended up with the, the, the thickest part of the fuselage being in the middle. And then the thickest part of the wings joined that fuselage in the same place. So if you took a series of cross-sectional cuts all through the aircraft, that you would find that the area would have this large jump and bulge in the middle. But scientists had been here before. Schlieren Photography showed all the clues. They had missed one. Right near the speed of sound, there weren't shock waves for the fuselage and the various parts of the airplane. There was one major shock wave, one big, big shock wave for the total airplane. Remember, they all converged on one. 